Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. May God be with you as we explore these readings. Um, quite complex, actually, and, uh, but with a central, a central message which is really important for the church today. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, speak to us that we may receive your spirit and through your spirit may share your love with one another and with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, we've got speaking to a rebellious nation. We've got Paul with his thorn in the flesh. And then we come to Jesus who couldn't do many miracles in his hometown. Uh, an interesting group of readings. Uh, what, what do we make of that? Excuse me, my throat is still a little bit tickly. Um, you know, sometimes we, we think that the, uh, the picture that we can get of the Christian faith is that the ultimate goal is that we know of our salvation, you know, that we accept Jesus as our Lord and Saviour, we know of our salvation, and then we look forward to our, our presence with God and our reward with God in heaven thereafter. And then we know that, of course, there's a thing on this earth we should be uh, participating um, in some kind of activity on this earth, and so there's uh, discipleship as well. But it's good to have a picture in our minds as to what that means. What, what is the goal of discipleship on this earth? What is the goal of our faith? Um, it's good to have a, a bit of a, a map as to what that looks like. You know, just like it's good to have a definition of the church, a functioning definition of church in your mind. It's good to have a, a definition of what salvation is. It's good to have a definition of what faith is. These are the things we live by. These are important things. And so it's good to have a bit of a map as to what this is. Um, this reading, particularly the gospel reading, uh, can tend to challenge some of the things we believe and teach about God and the Christian faith. There's one challenging thing here for me that I want to zero in on first. Where is it? Mark chapter 6. Um, verse 4. No. Yep. Yes, that's right. Jesus said to them, only in his hometown, among his relatives and in his own house, is a prophet without honour. And then verse 5, he could not do any miracles there except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. Here we have a disturbing verse, a couple of disturbing verses. He could not do any miracles there. There's something that God cannot do. What can God not do? That's a, that's a disturbing verse. We're, we're talking about creator of heaven and earth here. We're talking about the God who... who spoke and it was so. God who said, let there be light and there was light. God who said, let there be the earth and let there be the firmament above the waters and below the waters. Uh, let there be fish in the sea, let there be birds in the air and there was. You know, the Isaiah passage, the, the, um, just as the snow and rain comes down from the sky and brings forth uh, fruit from the earth, so my word when it goes out from my mouth will not return to me empty without first achieving that for which it was sent. This is the word of God we're talking about. This is the creator of heaven and earth speaking and it is, and it was so. Yet, he could not. Uh, 
I think it's, it's, both, it's puzzling, disturbing and profound that there's a situation in which God cannot work. And what is that situation? What's the environment in which the miraculous power of God comes to nothing? What's the, what has to go so wrong that God can't do his thing? What is it that pulls God up? Well, this verse tells us, this, uh, this passage, Mark 6, tells us what can disable, what can hobble God? He was amazed at their lack of faith. He could not work, in essence, he could not work because the people in his own hometown thought they knew him. You know, they, they said, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offence at him. Now this, apart from, apart from being the verse which tells us clearly who Jesus' siblings were, um, that he had siblings and that uh, Mary and Joseph had other children and that Jesus was not the only one. Um, this, uh, that tells it very clearly. Actually, it's interesting because uh, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas and Simon, um, you find James pops up again in Scripture as the writer of the book of James, right? As does Judas. He's got a brother called Judas, which would be unfortunate. It's um, later on in Jesus' life, that's a name that you would not want to have. But anyway, um, Jesus had a brother called Judas and uh, he pops up again. Well, many scholars suggest that Judas is the writer of the book, the letter of Jude. Um, so, just as a little aside, this is one of the major, for me anyway, this is one of the major uh, sidelights, one of the major proofs of Jesus' Messiahship. He had two brothers who became leaders of the church and believed in Jesus as the Messiah. If you look, if there's something wrong in your life, your brothers will know, right? You are the least famous in your brother's eyes. You can be famous throughout the world, but you will be ordinary to your brother. With Jesus, he has two brothers who become leaders in the church and say, he is the one, he is the one. Um, that's, that's big for me. I don't know, it, it never comes up anywhere else as a, as a thing, but, but that's just me. Anyway, um, but in his hometown... Among the people he knew him, who knew him, he was, as in his own words, a prophet without honour. People who know Jesus. You people who know Jesus. Do you think you know him too well? Does your knowledge of him, does your knowledge of the faith, does your, uh, does your sense of ownership of this faith and uh, proclamation of this faith, does that stop you from doing what God is calling you in your life? Does that reduce in you the wonder of, the, of what the Saviour has done in this world? Does, by our by our intimate knowledge of all of this, um, do, we, do we become blasé? Do we, 
do we become, oh yeah, ho-hum about what has happened? It, it can happen. You know, with, over time, we just get used to the wonder of it all. Um, you know when you live in a really fantastic place? Um, people in Canada aren't amazed at the scenery. Right? To them, it's backyard stuff. Right? G generally. They look at it and go, oh, this is a, you know. They don't walk out of their back door every morning and have their breath taken away by the scenery. We do. You know, when, we're, when you're driving along in Canada, you, you, you have to stop and look in awe. But people in, in Canada don't talk about the scenery. Uh, they're not amazed by it. They're born there. They see this every day. Um, do, do we... Do we know Jesus so well that he can't do any miracles among us? That, that is a thing. Like, like even today, you see where uh, the gospel is first heard. You see people rising to their feet out of wheelchairs. You see uh, cancer disappear. You see the dead are raised even in the current era. Um, you see lepers healed. You see uh, broken bones mend. Uh, you see even limbs grow back again. It's not hard to come across stories like that in places where the gospel is new and fresh. Where the gospel has been around for a few generations, these things tend to disappear. Why is that? Because we think we know Jesus too well. We think we know the faith too well. Let us not be an obstacle for God. Let, let us not be the one who stops God doing something in our day, in our life, uh, in the people around us by our lack of faith. I think that's very disturbing that a lack of faith can be thinking you know Jesus so well. It doesn't fit logically, does it? But this is what happened to Jesus. And this is how he maps it out. Mind you, it says there, this is, a, this is another little um, uh, shock for me. He could not do any miracles. He could not do any miracles there except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. Now, I think that's a pretty good strike rate. If you walk into a town, lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. You know, that, that's like I've found my ministry over the last 25 years extremely exciting because I've come across times where I have laid hands on a few sick people and they have been healed. Uh, not anywhere near as many as I would like but it does happen it continues to happen it goes on and and it's an exciting thing but for Jesus that's a sign of complete failure um, for Jesus he he highlights that as a complete disaster that that trip into that town was a complete disaster we're going to have to try somewhere else so anyway that's another little mind blow for me I want to put all these things together for you, particularly the readings that have been from the last couple of weeks and to today, because there's something that's been speaking to me over the last few weeks that, uh, that I've been trying to put together in my mind, so I hope I've got it together enough to be able to speak it out now. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine who, um, who was going through some things in his church, and I was... Uh, I was working with him to try and work out the best way of proceeding. You know, it wasn't going as well as, as, it, as could be hoped and things were, things were being stopped and 
prevented and slowed down through people's lack of vision and, you know, the, we've never done it this way before and things like that. Anyway, we were working through it and it occurred to me that when you ask the question, what is God doing in this situation? And maybe what God was doing was working on his relationship with this one individual, using the trauma of the whole church, was well, like when I go there, it's only a little church, so using the trauma of the whole church to just work on the relationship between God and this one person. And I think that's what God does. God's ultimate goal, like, remember when I was saying we need, a, we need a picture in our mind of how this faith works? We like to, in the Lutheran church, we like to have it clearly laid out as, um, as a list of precepts, you know, nicely, nice and neatly sorted out um, doctrines and teachings. We like that. We even number them. You know, the, like the Augsburg Confession, there are, you know, one through to, I uh, uh, can't remember how many there are now. Um, anyway, quite a number. Um, and um, 14. Um, because then the, the Anglican Church come along and stole them. Well, they didn't steal them. They, got, they pinched them very politely and broke them up into 39 articles. So they got 39. But they're just the same, right? Anyway, what was I saying? Yes, we, we like it nice and neat like that. That's, that's not God's picture. That it's certainly not what I'm getting from, from these readings. God's main purpose in the church is to grow his relationship with you. If you want it in one sentence... It's to develop his relationship with you. Yes, also develop your relationship with others. But the, the goal of faith is to grow in love with Christ and in love with one another. That's the main goal. Not to have all your doctrines right and not even to get healing. or That's, that's all secondary. Not even the miracles. They're not the main goal. They're only secondary. The primary one is the relationship. Why do I say that? Check this out. In the, in the f uh, second reading that Doreen read is, you know, Paul's thorn in the flesh, right? Paul went around, you know, he also healed people. He also, um, uh, you know, brought the gospel, brought the faith to many places. Even in his own life, though, he couldn't receive complete healing. Why? Because of his lack of faith. Why? Because he knew Jesus too well don't think so the thorn in the flesh remained why because God said to him my grace is sufficient for you now we I was thinking about that too because often we we've interpreted that as my grace as in my free gift of faith free gift of eternal life to you no that's too transactional that's our We've adopted the word grace to be a theological term. This is, got to remember, this is before theological terms were invented in the Christian church. Grace, a grace is something that is given to you by God. A grace is a gift. A grace is, you're better off using it in that way, a grace. It is a precious gift of God to you. This my graciousness to you is sufficient. My loving relationship with you, my, uh, what we've got together as God and earthly son, this is sufficient for you. This is what I want to grow in you, Paul. This is what you need to understand. It's not about... You know, Paul was a, was a theologian. He was a theologian of theologians. He was a scholar, right? To him, it was important to get the, 
the little things of faith worked out in, in the minutest detail. That was important for him and a great gift to the church. But what was God saying to him? Yes, Paul, all that's good. But my grace is sufficient for you. My relationship with you, my love for you is sufficient for you. Get a hold of that, Paul, and you'll have it all. That's what Paul needed to learn. That's why this thorn in the flesh kept bugging him. What have you got that's bugging you through your life? What's your thorn in the flesh? What keeps pressing against you and, and maybe even questions your faith? That's where, have a think about that because that's where God will be working. That's where, we, where God will be calling you to trust him. Calling you that through even the darkest hours, when you say, why God, why me? God will be saying, this is a precious moment for you and me because now you've got nothing left but to call on my name and to call on me. Let's use this to grow in love together so that then you'll be able to see the purpose and then your healing can come, which will be a much greater healing than you're asking for. Let my grace be sufficient for you. And I think that's a, that's a precious moment. It was certainly a precious moment for Paul because he put it in those words. He was able to couch it in, in this passage. But it's a precious moment for each of us when we come to the centre of our faith, when we come to the end of ourselves, there's nothing more that we can bring to the relationship. There's nothing more that we... You know, the questions are too big in my head and I just can't overcome it. The suffering is too great. The obstacles are too big. What do I do, Lord? And we come to the end of ourselves and we discover the loving grace of God. And we hear those words, my grace is sufficient for you and we can echo that's when the the wonder happens that's when the healing occurs is when we can say thank you jesus your grace is sufficient for me your love is all i need when we can say that we've discovered what the christian faith is about your love is all i need You know, when someone's bugging you, when you this is this is why I say that you get you know, you, you get people in church and they can argue, right? It can happen, can't it? You know, there was probably a time here in nineteen fifty three that somebody had an argument. It it may may happen. You know, you'll get one person is bugged by another. And what can happen is I, I know I know that I've heard stories that before amalgamation here, there was a, a well-worn path between the um, uh, Elka and New Elka churches, right, when it was, the other church was up on the hill somewhere. Because, you know, someone would get in, offended in one church and they could go and take up residence in another. And one would get offended up there and they could come down here. Um, amalgamation stopped that and we all had to get on together. And, but it can happen. You can get grumpy with someone. Right, I'm not, I'm not going to church again. That, that'll show them. Oh, yeah, well, that, that really showed them. That really helped a lot, didn't it? It can happen. Why does that happen? I think that's a, that's a, a blessed, that is a grace in itself when you're offended by someone. Because you're about to come to the point where you realise your grace is sufficient for me. You're about to discover love that is undeserved love for somebody else. You're about to discover what forgiveness means you're, and then people just drop at the ball and take up their bat and ball and go and they miss all of that blessing. They miss the healing and God cannot work. We put the brakes on God. This, I believe, brothers and sisters in Christ, is why the church in Australia 
is so weak because we've missed the grace. Time and time again, we've prevented our Lord from working because we've ignored the growth opportunities, we've been offended, we think we know too well and we go off in a huff. I keep seeing it time and time again and it seems impossible but this this is what we're faced with. We also have the, like we are the problem so we are, we are the answer. It's so easy to fix the problem. Just let God work. Let let the grumpy person be grumpy. Forgive easily. His mercies are new every morning. Just wait for the next morning and start all over again with God because he's got it in his hands and let God work. My grace is sufficient with you. I will work through you, God says, but you have to let me. May his grace be sufficient for you. May his blessing be upon you. May his grace be upon you. May his forgiveness flow from you. And may his love burst forth from you that his spirit may work through you. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, now and always. Amen.